Welcome, everybody. Um, you're very welcome to the UCL Lunch Hour Lecture Series, and it's a great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, UCL's Professor Samir Zeki. Um, Zeki is a neurobiologist. He was educated at UCL, and um, he was appointed uh, Professor of Neurobiology since 2008. He's also been Professor of Neuroesthetics at UCL. He's done pioneering research exploring visual areas of the brain, and his most recent work is devoted to identifying the neural correlates of affective states, love, desire, and beauty. And he's a very distinguished public speaker. He's the author of three books, and uh, he is also an artist. I was hoping he'd show some of his, his work today. Uh, he's joining us to discuss what happens to our brain when we experience beauty whether it derives from perceptual sources <coughs> like musical or visual beauty or from cognitive ones like mathematical beauty. And ultimately, he's going to tell us what that says about the use of beauty itself. A very warm welcome, Professor Zeki. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving up a lovely day like this to come and listen to me. I'm going to talk about a, a topic which I, I find one of the most uh, interesting but difficult topics to approach, which is the experience of beauty. Now, it is important to emphasize that neurobiology does not address the question of what beauty is. That's a complicated question which has been debated by philosophers of aesthetics and historians of art for 2,500 years, though without adequate resolution. The aim of neurobiology and neuroaesthetics is, is much more limited and scientifically manageable. So the question that neurobiology asks is, what are the neural mechanisms that are engaged when we experience beauty? It is in every way similar to asking the other scientific or another scientific question, such as what are the neural mechanisms that are engaged when we experience color? Color and beauty both being subjective experiences. Now, in approaching this problem, neurobiology has certain beliefs which are self-evident, namely that all humans, regardless of gender or race or ethnicity or educational background or age, are able to experience beauty. And uh, therefore, the uh, experience of beauty is not limited to people who are highly qualified, indeed these are people who you do not wish to involve in your experiments, because as Clive Bell, the English art historian, said and summarized in his book, Art, that what we want to understand is what is common to all and peculiar to none. Now, although neuroesthetics uh, does not study beauty, does not uh, try to address the question of what beauty is, it is nevertheless inspired by the writings and the philosophies of aesthetics and the history of art to address its questions. And Clive Bell, whom I've just quoted to you, summarized it very well for the neurobiologist when he asked in his book, same book, Art, published in 1914, he said, what is it that is in common to all that we experience as beautiful? What is in common to Santa Sophia in Istanbul, the windows at Chartres Cathedral in France, a Mexican sculpture, a Chinese bowl, Persian carpets, and the masterpieces of Poussin, Pierre da Francesca, and Cezanne. This, this is his list. So that unless they have something in common in arousing the aesthetic emotion, when we speak about aesthetic emotion, we gibber. So what is it? He did not give an answer, but the question that he framed was very, very good and experimentally amenable for studying uh, scientifically. Now, <coughs> his list is a visual list. We want to go beyond that because the philosophies of aesthetics treat beauty in the abstract. They're not restricted to visual beauty or musical beauty, but, but also include poetic beauty, uh, literary beauty, uh, rhetorical beauty, and so on. So we wanted to expand that to include other uh, experiences of beauty derived from other sources. And I would like to describe for you at the beginning the experiment, which is common to all the experiments I shall describe, so that you uh, are in no doubt what is being studied. 
So what you do is to get subjects equally divided between males and females, and preferably from as many different ethnic and cultural backgrounds that you can, and show them pictures, many pictures, over 120, and ask them to rate each one, rates these pictures according to how much, uh, how beautiful they think them to be, and uh, on a scale of one to 10. And they listen to musical excerpts, and they rate them again uh, from one to 10 on the basis of how beautiful each individual subject in the experiment uh, experiences them to be. Um, we exclude all subjects who are musical excerpts, experts or um, uh, artists or art historians because of what Clive Bell said in his book. He said, if you want to know about beauty, don't go to an art historian because he knows too much. You must go to savages and children and people who are uneducated because they too are able to experience beauty. And that's why we excluded all musicians uh, and, and uh, anyone involved with art. Now, having rated the uh, pictures and the musical ex excerpts, they come back to us and review those paintings in the scanner, the magnetic resonance imaging scanner, and rate them again after each viewing. And the principle on which the magnetic scanners work is very simple, really, in principle, although difficult in execution, is that when cells in a particular part of the brain are especially active, then the blood flow to them increases, and the scanners around the head can detect the change in blood flow and hence localize the areas which are active when you experience something or the other. And let me show you, to begin with, the sort of pictures that most people, not all, but most people, found beautiful. Okay, so this is the odalisk by uh, Ang, which most people qualified as being extremely beautiful. And the reason why it's zoomed out over 16 seconds is to be able to make an adequate comparison with the musical excerpt, which of course developed in time. Now, the next one is, is something which most people found ugly. This is a painting by Lucien Freud, the benefit supervisor, after uh, taking a nap. And here you see the importance of excluding uh, art uh, connoisseurs, because this is a great painting in the sense that it is a, uh, done in a very painterly way. It fetch a fortune at auction. It, uh, it uh, projects uh, the passage of time and uh, decadence and decay and corpulence. But it is not one which people experience as beautiful, which is what uh, was important for us, experience beautiful during the experiment. And for musical excerpt, this is one that all are very different, without exception. of Mahler's Fifth Symphony. And the next one is one which they all qualified as ugly. And again, what you see there is that uh, that piece may be perceived as ugly, but it may have great musical qualities which are accessible to a, a musical connoisseur. So what happens in the brain when people look at visual stimuli is that you get activity in the visual cortex shown at the back, that in white. And when they listen to musical <coughs> excerpts, uh, they get activity in the auditory cortex, which is normal enough. But when you ask the question, what uh, is the activity that correlates with those stimuli which they declared to see as beautiful, you find that with, music, with visual stimuli, there is activity in, of course, visual cortex and the caudate. But more important, there's activity in the front of the brain there, in a region which, is of the, which belongs to the emotional brain, which is known as the medial orbital frontal cortex. And when you look at the areas of the brain which are especially active when they experience musical beauty, you find that it is located in the same part there in green now, and here is the conjunction of the two. So the experience of, let me just summarize up this point, the experience of beauty derived from different sensory sources, in this case musical, or visual, 
correlates with high activity in the same part of the emotional brain, namely the medial orbitofrontal cortex. A central question in the philosophies of aesthetics has been, can aesthetic experience ever be quantified? And the answer is yes. So if you look at the uh, uh, blood flow, the, the, the intensity of the blood flow, and hence of cortical activity, when people are looking at beautiful uh, pictures, and there's activity in the medial orbital frontal cortex, you find that the activity <coughs> is proportional there to the declared intensity of beauty. The more beautiful someone experiences a visual stimulus to be, the uh, more intense the activity. And the same is true for musical beauty. The more beautiful a musical uh, excerpt is experienced to be, the higher the activity. Hence, for the first time, and this is the importance of this can't be overemphasized, a highly subjective experience, that of beauty, can be uh, quantified in these terms. And so, uh, so is the case with ugliness. So stimuli which are qualified as ugly lead to activity in other parts of the brain, namely the amygdala, uh, which you can see in that slide, and the motor cortex. And <coughs> the amygdala has been traditionally uh, associated with fear and disgust and anger, among other things. And the activity there is also proportionately uh, related to the intensity with which something is, is experienced as ugly. So the uglier it's declared to be, the higher the intensity of the amygdala and the motor cortex. Now, <coughs> the Greeks had a single word, kalon, to me to signify uh, physical beauty and moral beauty. Plato wrote that physical beauty is an indicator of inner spiritual and moral beauty. And they had <coughs> um, some iconic figures to, to, to signify that, of which one of the most famous is the Westmacott Youth at the British Museum and exhibited in their recent exhibition, Defining Beauty. Now, this is a, a uh, this Westmacott athlete actually is a Roman copy of the original Greek, which was done 2,500 years ago. And it is supposed to show in one construction a beautiful physique, which is counterbalanced by humility uh, and modesty by the downturn face of an athlete who has just been victorious in an athletic contest. And it is common knowledge, <coughs> you know and I know and we all know, that people who are very beautiful uh, are people to whom we impute moral qualities which they do not necessarily have. It is well documented. This is currently known as the um, beautiful is good stereotype. It has been documented that people who are very beautiful have advantages at um, uh, interviews. They certainly are in the legal system, they get uh, lighter sentences. But we discover to our cost often that uh, the two are not correlated. However, in a study undertaken in the United States by Tsukura and Cabeza, they found that in fact the experience of moral beauty correlates with activity in the same part of the brain as the experience of visual or musical beauty. And the experiments there are conducted as follows. So you get people in the scanner and you ask them these questions and rate them according to their moral beauty or moral ugliness. Uh, he raped a girl. These are questions they ask, not me. He raped a girl, that's morally ugly. He gave up his food to a hungry child when he was hungry. That's morally beautiful. And when they do that, they find that the activity in the brain that correlates with the experience of moral beauty and visual beauty, because they also included facial attractiveness, shown there in the medial orbital frontal cortex. In the upper right histogram, you've got the uh, relationship between blood flow and um, MRI activity and attractiveness ratings. And lower one here is the relationship between uh, blood flow and goodness ratings. And here is the relationship between the two, which shows a very, very positive, almost going through the origin, very positive relationship between attractiveness uh, ratings 
and um, ratings for moral beauty. And I suggest, and this is only a, 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 a suggestion, that the reason why we continue, in spite of the evidence before our eyes, to associate, to uh, impute higher moral qualities to people who are good looking and not do so for people who are not, is because of the association of the two in giving pleasure, which is reflected in the activity of the medial orbital frontal cortex. Now, beauty is, of course, linked to desire. And you can, I'm, I'm sorry this is rather small, but you can see where the crosshairs are, that when you put people in the scanner and ask them to rate events, like holidays, going to a concert, according to how desirable they are, persons, women, men, and um, objects, cars, watches, and so on, you find that the more highly an object or a person or an event is desirable for a person, the greater the activity in the exactly the same part of the brain, the medial orbital frontal cortex. By the way, of course, you know, since the time of Plato, beauty and desire have been strongly linked, and this is a neurobiological reflection of this well-attested fact. And again, the relationship between the intensity of activity in the medial orbital frontal cortex and the declared intensity of the desire is uh, parametrically linked that the, the, the higher the desire, the, the declared desire, the greater the blood flow. Again, emphasizing a very important fact that these subjective states, and in my belief, all experiences are subjective, including elementary visual experiences, these subjective states can be studied and can be quantified in terms of neurobiology. And these results I'm showing you mainly ours, but they have been uh, confirmed by many other laboratories in many other parts of the world. Now, all this raises a very interesting question, a question of huge neurobiological significance, uh, which has very little relationship with beauty studies, but beauty studies are well placed to address them, which is that each cortical area has got multiple outputs, 10, 15, not a single one. And the question that neurobiology has to address is, are all these outputs from an area engaged when that area undertakes a particular activity, or are they engaged on a selective basis? The way in which neurobiology can address that question is as follows. Now, this is a hypothetical diagram, but it represents the reality. At the very back there in uh, yellow and orange is the visual cortex. There are many visual areas, but I'm representing them as one here. In blue and, uh, and, and green is an area of the brain which is critical for perception of human bodies. In yellow is the amygdala, which is responsive when, when people uh, experience something as ugly. And in front is the medial orbital frontal cortex when they experience them as beautiful. So when people look at this, the first two areas are active. And then the third one is the medial orbital frontal cortex. But when they look at this, the activity is shared with the first two areas, but then is shunted to the amygdala. So somewhere in here, a selection is taking place. I don't know how. I don't know why. But there's a certain selective mechanism that says these signals must now correlate with activity in this area or in that area. Edmund Burke, the Anglo-Irish philosopher who, is, who gave one of the most famous definitions of beauty, wrote of it as follows. He said, beauty is, I'm quoting, beauty is for the greater part a property of objects acting mechanically upon the human mind through the intervention of the senses." Unquote. So see that in this definition, two thirds of it is neurobiology, the mind, which I equate with the brain, and uh, the, the senses. And a third is objects. So can we discern anything in the properties of objects that actually would lead to preferences and to activity in the medial orbital frontal cortex? Can, can we do so without the intervention of humans? So what we did was to get the computer through fuzzy logic to uh, prepare kinetic stimuli, stimuli which are made of dots of equal size and luminance uh, uh, and speed of motion, 
but of different configurations, of which this is the one which most, if not most, all subjects preferred <coughs> among the 21 variants prepared by the computer shown. And this is the one which they all said they did not like. And guess what? When you put them in the scanner and do the same experiment, they look at these and re-rate them, you find that the activity in the brain that correlates with the preferred stimuli, which are prepared by a computer, by the way, uh, occurs in this area shown in yellow here, which is area V5, an area which is well known to be specialized for visual motion. And the activity in that area is proportional to the declared intensity of the preference. And the stimuli, which are declared to be the preferred ones, also correlate, the experience of these correlate with activity in the medial orbital frontal cortex shown here in the crosshairs. So again, some, some credibility to the definition given by Edmund Burke. But you don't have to go. You don't have to go to these uh, uh, impersonal experiments designed by computers because there's good evidence from the world of art. And we, m I must say to you that we are deeply, deeply inspired by the world of art and the, by, the, uh, by the philosophies of aesthetics. Although we address other questions, we pay huge attention to what they say because they've been pondering these questions for a long time. Now, the great British artist, um, uh, the Francis Bacon, declared that he wanted to give a visual shock. It's worth listening to him say it. I want to give me a shock. Now, shock, you could say, is a form of expression. But what expression it is, I don't know. It's a visual shock. It's not, it's not a, a shock about, um, it's not a, sto a shock that you could get from a story. It's, a, it's just a, a, a visual shock. And reminiscent of what Clive Bell wrote, saying that, don't worry, Clive Bell and Marcel Proust actually as well, don't worry about the intellect and the intelligence, just go for the raw emotions in the city experience. Don't ask people who are intelligent and more educated. He said the same thing in preparing his pictures. Because I made images that intellect would never make. So his uh, aim, his avowed aim, was to give a visual shock and uh, to do it without appeal to the intellect. And what did he do? He prepared drawings which subverted the brain's representation of what a normal face should look like and subverted the brain's representation of what the brain's representation of a body should look like. His first exhibition in New York in 1953, retrospective, <coughs> was described in Time magazine as a chamber of horrors. And the last one in London in, 19, in 2013 was described in The Guardian as um, a view of private hells. Mrs. Thatcher probably gave the best summary of the common view. Uh, saying, oh, Francis Bacon, that horrible man who paints those dreadful pictures. <laughs> now, <coughs> he is a great painter, but his aim was to project violence and horror, and he did it by subverting faces and bodies, but never objects. See this again, very, very mutilated body, distorted body, but the deck chair is uh, is, the stool is, is quite clear, but the body is deeply mutilated. So he understood instinctively that the brain did have a, uh, and, and the child, of course, orients towards a, a human face within the first three, four hours after birth. There is a certain pattern which we are born with, which is probably a very complex pattern. It involves proportion and symmetry, which have been considered to be um, characteristic of beauty. Certainly, if you want to read about the golden ratio, the papers where you find, the, the journals where you find most written about it are in the journals of maxillofacial surgery. But that now brings me to the last issue I want to address, which is uh, mathematical beauty. Because the beauty that I've been talking about so far has been largely uh, beauty which has a sensory source, not moral beauty. A, there is a question, of course, of whether we're born with moral qualities or not. But the most extreme example 
of beauty which is derived from a highly cognitive source and is totally dependent upon education and learning is mathematical beauty. In the sense that you cannot pick up somebody in the streets at night and show them a mathematical, mathematical equation and ask them whether it's beautiful or not. Whereas you can show them a picture and ask them whether they find it beautiful or not. So to do this experiment, you have to recruit mathematicians who are educated. And what we did was to get mathematicians in postgraduate and postdoctoral level. And mathematicians are extremely fussy people, you know. I mean, to prepare, it took six years to prepare this experiment because, <laughs> because mathematicians were always fighting about the, the validity of that equation. One mathematician would say, this has got too much physics. I'm sorry, I can't put up with this. No. Too much chemistry, too much uh, uh, Euclidean space. So in the end, we whittled it down to 60 equations, which they kindly agreed to. And we got the mathematicians to look at these experiments, rate them, and then go to the scanner and re-rate them. And they find, we found that the most beautiful equation, uh, uh, one which was experienced as beautiful by all, was Euler's identity equation, which links five mathematical uh, constants with three basic arithmetic operations, each occurring once. This has been described by my colleague on this paper, who was a very uh, brilliant, math one of the most brilliant mathematicians of our time, Michael Atiyah, as the mathematical equivalent of uh, uh, Hamlet soliloquy. And the next one, which was uh, described as ugly by most, is uh, Ramanujan's, Ramanujan's equation expressing the inverse value of pi as an infinite sum. Now, um, some mathematicians have written to me objecting that this should be uh, viewed as an ugly one, as an ugly equation. That's not my problem, and it doesn't matter, because what we're interested in is how these were experienced during the experiment, that's all. And the answer to the experiment is really quite extraordinary. And I was dazzled by it with every subject who came through and, and whose results I studied, which is that activity during the experience of mathematical beauty uh, occurs in the media orbital frontal cortex. It is parametrically related to the um, intensity of the declared experience of mathematical beauty. More highly, a, a mathematical ex a equation experience is beautiful, the in more intense the activities are. Which brings us to what are the uses of beauty. Charles Darwin um, thought of beauty as if in being in importance for sexual selection, which of course is true. But Plato, before him, long before him, wrote that mathematical beauty is the highest form of beauty because it is eternal. It does not change at all. And it gives you an insight into the structure of the universe. The, the, the line which he quoted, I'll try to remember, is from Philippus. He says that the world is cast in a frame which can be apprehended by mind and reason. We put it the other way around, probably. You say, the mind and reason are apprehended in a frame which can comprehend the structure of the world. Let me tell you that uh, mathematical beauty is not just for the pleasure and experience of mathematicians in their studies. The great English physicist Paul Dirac wrote in 1933, and I'm going to quote him to you, perhaps not verbatim, but nearly so. He said that the theory of relativity imported beauty into ma mathematics to an unprecedented degree. Before his time, Einstein's time, the guide to the truthfulness of a mathematical equation was its simplicity. But since the theory of uh, relativity, the guide to the truthfulness of a mathematical equation must be its beauty. So if you have to choose between simplicity and beauty, as to the truthfulness of a mathematical equation, you have to go by its uh, beauty. And of course, mathematical equations have allowed us to apprehend, to apprehend facts before they were discovered. Um, the, the, the dark energy, dark um, black holes, dark matter are all conclusions reached through mathematical formulations. And if you listen to the people who have 
reach these conclusions, you'll find the word beauty occurring again and again and again and again. Maybe I'll end up with a story of Hermann Weil, a very brilliant mathematician, and Albert Einstein. Uh, Hermann Weil wanted to reconcile. Well, Hermann Weil said, I, in my work, I always try to combine truth with beauty. But if I have to choose between the two, I always choose uh, beauty. And he tried to reconcile the, the electromagnetism of James Clerk Maxwell and the gravitational theories of Einstein and came up with a formula which he thought was very nice. And Einstein liked it too, except that he said you can't publish it because it's against all the known facts. Well, it was published with an appendix given, giving the objections of Einstein. But 10 years after the publication of this, and with the advent of quantum mechanics, the formulations of uh, uh, Hermann Weyl were found to be all correct. And now the paper is republished without the objections of uh, uh, Einstein's an appendix. So a triumph, you might say, of truth over beauty, of beauty over truth, unless, unless you go back to Keats and say, truth is beauty, beauty is truth. That is all you know and all you need to know. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions, and there are friends with microphones <laughs> roaming around. Hi, I, I really enjoyed that. I wanted to ask about synergy. If you, if you add, say, musical and visual beauty, do you get an amplified effect in the brain? The concept of the <laughs> Gesamtkunstwerke. Well, uh, um, I haven't done that experiment, uh, and I don't know anyone who has, but uh, it's a very interesting and important question, yes. Uh, uh, by the way, I mean, you can just uh, the exp you can take it as the experiment is done and all you have to do is to formalize it because we know it's been used for years in films. You put music in and it heightens the emotional intensity. Okay. <coughs> yeah, me. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for... Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm over here. Where? I, uh, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, it's just a bit disconcerting when you're looking at it. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what you, what you would consider neuro, the neurobiology or neuroaesthetic approach, wh whether what it added or what it possibly subtracted from existing accounts of morality and free will, as in Kant, or aesthetic form, as in the philosophy aesthetic theories of events, Kazira or, or Langer? Yes. Well, uh, look, neuroaesthetic is constituted for understanding the brain. Uh, and it, uh, it assumes that certain experiences which we all have, experiences of beauty and morality, <coughs> are worthy of study. And we try to understand how the brain is constructed to study these. I'm not sure that we would add anything to, uh, significant to these views. I have a, a, a bone to pick with Immanuel Kant, who's dead, of course, I can't do it. Uh, I think that his uh, priors are probably wrong. Um, but uh, he, he has been extremely inspiring in, in, in channeling our experiments. But I don't think we are really, we're not, we're not on the same plane because we're studying the brain. Uh, thank you very much for this really interesting topic. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, you said that uh, to a person your uh, subjects responded in these ways, but I'm wondering if there are individuals who actually act in the opposite work direction. In other words, the, what most people find beautiful, they find, what most people find ugly, they might find beautiful. Because I'm wondering if there's any sort of psychopathological implication of yeah of that relationship. Right. This, would not, this would not figure in the experiment for the very simple reason that once you, when you do the comparisons in terms of brain activity, you include what they found as ugly and what they found as beautiful, which may be very different from what others found as beautiful. So n no doubt, I mean, there are people who find, uh, this is true, the people who find very sort of um, deformed bodies very beautiful. This is true. 
But uh, it doesn't matter. We are only asking the question of, do you find it beautiful? Right? And we look at the brain scan, his brain or her brain scan, at that moment. And then, in the total comparison, we take the beautiful versus the ugly, no matter what they were. Have you ever disaggregated your data to look at whether their perceptual judgment of beauty is different from the norm and whether there might be other correlates of that response? Well, we haven't detected any of that, but let me just say that we have taken what we consider to be very normal people. In other words, uh, you know, ordinary, no, no great uh, connoisseurs of art or beauty or anything like that, or great devotees. Gentleman at the back, yes. Hello. I'm over this way. Yeah. Hello, thank you for that. That was wonderful. Um, so my question is, would you say that um, the idea of beauty is intrinsically linked to the paradigm or era in which these experiments are taking place? So you could do the same set test over a number of years and watch like shifts and changes in the average understanding of what something beautiful is. And also, would you say there's like a link to evolutionary biology in some sense? Mm -hmm. like, is there survival aspects to us understanding something beautiful? Yes, well, I mean, the latter is true. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, first of all, the, 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 there are, if you look at the paintings of Tiziano, you would find that he liked plump women. It's not at all the fashion today. Uh, so there are these differences, but there are basic similarities which have not changed over, over the ages. The uh, uh, eyes and the nose and the mouth uh, and the forehead have all got to be in very good uh, proportions and in symmetrical arrangement with respect to each other. This has not changed, and I think we're born with that. It is a Bayesian prior, if you like. The same with the, uh, with the body. I mean, lips have got to be in certain proportion to the trunk and so on. And in general, in general, there is a race effect, but it's a mild one, but in general, person who's extremely beautiful in Japan would be considered to be extremely beautiful in uh, Europe or in Africa, which is the basis of the internationalization of the catwalk models. Okay. So I think that you are right, that there is a change uh, in fashion over time, but the basic the skeletal element has not changed, which is what we are interested in studying. Could you remind me of the last one? Which you said? The second part was um, whether there's any link to evolutionary biology in the sense yes, of there's yes. any survival value in recognizing beauty. Well, 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 uh, selection uh, in Charles Darwin, The Descent of Man, the, the beauty is uh, tied to sexual selection. But it turns out that it's much more complicated than that because, see, uh, women who uh, select the most desirable men do not select Tom Cruise. They select people, or necessarily Tom Cruise, they select people who, whose cheeks are, are, are uh, rosy and who look like they could be good providers. Uh, so there are other factors that go into it besides the, the, the great beauty. Perhaps we have appetite for just one last question. Hello there. Um, thanks for the lecture. Um, in a way, you say that mathematical beauty is somehow subjective. So Wait, what, what beauty? Mathematical beauty yes. is subjective. Yes. Uh, and that beauty, in a way, is linked to truth. Would you say that um, if we had a different brain structure, our understanding of mathematics would be different? And that well, in that uh, way? Well, fabulous question. Let me say that I, I not say mathematical uh, beauty is subjective. And the experience of mathematical beauty is subjective, which is quite something else. Now, I think that the mathematician, when he hit upon the right uh, uh, mathematical formulation, it is one that satisfies the deductive logical system of the brain. Mm -hmm. And so when I say that it's the most extreme form of beauty derived from uh, culture and learning, it's not true, because mathematicians from different cultures, provided they understand the, uh, the language of mathematics, can reach the same conclusion. In, um, I went to the World Economic Forum in Davos years ago, and, and they put me in a wrong uh, 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 symposium, one on mathematics. And I said, look, I'm not a mathematician. They said, well, don't come out. But I was told, are you afraid of mathematicians? Go and talk to them. <laughs> so the question I raised was, would we ever have come up, uh, in front of these uh, eminent mathematicians, would we have ever come up with uh, the string theory? Mm -hmm. 
unless we have the kind of logical deductive system that we have. Well, it took them all three hours to discuss it without conclusion, but it was an interesting question which relates to yours. But, but would you say that as we evolve coming back to evolution and how our, possibly our brain changes with evolution that our comprehension and our mathematical theorems will also change? Our comprehension of reality will change? Well, my belief on mathematics, and, and I'm not a mathematician, my belief on, in mathematics is that there are certain theorems which are uh, basic and which do not change upon which the rest of mathematics is built. In set theory, for example, uh, the fact that if you've got uh, two things, uh, two groups of things uh, that are identical in every way, then each individual from these would look the same, would be the same. This is something that does not change. In Euclidean geometry, uh, two lines which are parallel will never meet. And then you introduce spherical geometry and things change. Sure, we could carry on the conversation for a long time, but this is all we have time for today. So please join me in thank <laughs> thanking Professor Zeki.